Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our community forum on social security. I'm Maureen Riley. I'm the operations director here at the Mustard Seed. And we are going through an exciting time right now as we reopen after the latest COVID shutdowns. We are starting our art classes, our exercise classes, and we're open again for meetings and we will be open for open activity hours on April 1st so that people can drop by in the afternoons and knit, do a jigsaw puzzle, just sit and have a cup of coffee and a pastry, whatever you want to do. Um, for more information on these activities, please check our Facebook page and our website. I'd like to introduce now Matt Santelli from the Aging and Disability Resource Center. Matt is going to lead us through at least the surface of the very complex issue of social security. If you're with us on Zoom, please type your questions into the chat. If you're listening on Facebook, you can put your uh, questions in the comments and uh, Anne, our admin assistant, will convey them via chat to Matt. And with that, I would like to hand over this presentation to Matt Santelli. Welcome. Thanks, Maureen. Thanks for everyone tuning in uh, live. Um, yeah, I do have a PowerPoint that I prepared that I will put up on the screen and we'll go through it with some logical stops uh, to see if any questions have come through as we go through it. So, and I've added some other information in there that gets a little, little bit into the weeds, but might be relevant to folks who have experienced certain aspects of the social security program. So let me go ahead and get this set up to share. Okay. Yeah. All right, there we go. Can everybody see it? Okay, so uh, this is kind of a basics of social security presentation. And um, it's part of what we call our hot topic series because we try to build topics that are relevant to folks and in the senior and disabled population. And I wanna do a special thank you to uh, Kirk Larson uh, from Social Security. Much of this presentation is kind of borrowed from his and I've just adapted it to kind of meet our county guidelines. Um, the disclaimer that I have to give is that this information provided during this presentation is not intended to serve as an exhaustive list of benefits available from Social Security. Uh, Social Security benefit availability depends upon earned income, work history, and or disability status. Uh, clients seeking complete information about their own social security benefits need to contact social security directly at 1-800-772-1213 or uh, www.socialsecurity.gov. And I put that on there because everybody's situation in terms of claiming social security is specific to them. And so there's different views on what's the best time to claim social security what, what method you use in terms of claiming on your own benefit or on a spouse's benefit. Um, should you claim it early if you're still working, things like that. So we'll kind of touch on those principles, but it's really specific to your situation. Right now, the good news is that after about a two year hiatus due to the virus, uh, most local social security offices are open again for scheduled in-person meetings. If anyone's visited the Tacoma office, for example, prior to the virus, it was always very crowded shoulder to shoulder in that small room and you'd wait to be called in if you were a walk-in. Uh, now they're really trying to limit concerns about virus spread. And so for a long time, they weren't open at all, but they're open now for scheduled in-person meetings, which means you would have to call the toll-free line, wait on hold and ask them what questions you have, if they can resolve it through the phone or through the mail. Otherwise, you can't ask them to go into the uh, meeting uh, at the office there in Tacoma. And I believe there's a Bremerton office too, I think, for those of you that might be closer than coming into Tacoma. Information about online or mail options can be found at the website. There's a lot of good information on the socialsecurity.gov website. 
And then the phone option is certainly available as well. Um, now, what I've taken to do when I was visiting clients in their homes, we haven't done much of that in the last two years, but we'll be doing it again soon. I would usually call Social Security when I left the office because if I'm on a 20 minute drive, normally when you call them, you're on a 45 minute to one hour wait. So that kind of ate up some time waiting on hold to get to the client's home. Um, now, if you're working with clients, you're generally going to need to have them there with you to get questions answered about their account. And the same goes true for family members. I would have to call with my mom and dad even into their 90s because I wasn't a payee for them on Social Security. That's the only status that Social Security recognizes in terms of sharing information is if you're a payee for an individual. If you're husband, wife, it doesn't matter. They have to be there with you when you call. And one thing I always tell people is if you're calling them, you'll generally get a notice when you call in that says there's a 45 minute wait or there's a one hour and 15 minute wait. Sometimes they'll pick up early, sometimes they'll pick up late. And so I always advise people if you're going to be at home on that wait, put it on a speaker and have your batteries charged on your phone because if they pick up early, you need to be ready to answer. And they're going to give you a couple of hellos and then they're going to hang up. And then you're going to be stuck calling them back again. So you got to be ready for that situation. because They won't call you back if uh, they hang up on you. One warning we're always giving people is that Social Security will never call to warn you that your account has been locked or your benefits have been reduced or delayed or you need to change your direct deposit bank information. Any such correspondence will come through the U.S. mail. Make sure to contact Social Security directly to make sure they have a recent address change or if you changed a PO box as your mailing address. The general rule is they will not forward mail from Social Security for security purposes. So it'll get sent back to Social Security. So it's not unusual I hear from clients that say, I didn't get my Social Security information and that's because they never put in their change of address. So a lot of these scam calls go out, um, especially this time of year. They went out last year when the economic uh, stimulus payments were going out and telling people, oh, you missed your payment. We'll, we'll, we'll reissue it for you. Again, Social Security is not in the business of calling you on the phone. They would only call you if you were working with a specific Social Security case manager on a specific case, but then you would know who that person is by mail ahead of time. So again, if you're getting calls, if clients get calls, Basically, those are all scam calls. And for those of us who got economic impact payments last year, that should have gone direct to your bank account or your social security bank account. Some people tell me they still haven't gotten them, in which case this would be the time to file a tax return to claim those, those, those economic impact payments from last year. So that's the process by which you would have to claim those if you haven't gotten it yet. They've all been distributed out already. So. Keep that in mind again, if you have clients say, well, I never got it, then first thing they should do is look back through their bank statements because I've had clients not realize they got it. Second thing they should do, if they're certain they didn't get it, they're gonna need to talk to a tax advisor about filing uh, tax uh, filing this year to claim that economic impact payment. So here's an overview of what we'll talk about today. We're gonna talk about the social security program in general. And then retirement benefits we'll touch on, disability benefits we'll touch on, spousal benefits, survivor benefits. We'll very briefly touch on disabled adult child benefits because some professionals might run across that. Some families might have a situation where they'd want to apply for that. And then we'll be taking questions and answers hopefully along the way. Some trivia I found on the Social Security website was that according to Social Security in 2020, the top name for baby boys was Liam, and the top name for baby girls was Olivia. So it's interesting if you look back on the Social Security website, you can see the different most popular baby names going year after year. These almost seem kind of like uh, old fashioned names to me, Liam and Olivia. I've known a few in Olivia's. I think the only Liam I know is the Liam Neeson, who's the action star in Hollywood. But, but I do know a few Olivia's, and my goddaughter has a few Olivia's in her high school class. So. Okay, so what's available at the website? There's the instructions on how to set up your account. There's frequently asked questions and answers. There's specific information about the programs we're gonna talk about today. And a lot of other topics and discussions that you might find of value to you. 
especially if you're working with clients, there's a lot of good information on there. And if you set up a My Social Security account, there's all kinds of things you can do. You can review your statements, verifying what your yearly wages and benefit estimates are for your current situation and past wage earning situations. You can check the status if you've done an application or are appealing a disability ruling, perhaps. You can get a verification letter for proof of income. So a lot of situations where you need to show what your Social Security income is, you can print those out from the website. I set up an account with my dad a few years ago and we were able to get a verification letter for him. You can make a change of address, phone number or bank direct deposit information. You can get a replacement 1099 for tax filing or benefit purposes. We ask for these a lot for clients if we're doing the property tax exemption at the county, for example, because we can go back three years on setting up those exemptions. So we try to get those 1099 forms. You can get a replacement Medicare card or verification letter of Medicare coverage. And then you can also uh, open your account, get started by establishing a username, password, and security code, which is sent by text or email. Now, I've had situations with clients where their social security card, unfortunately, doesn't reflect the information on file. So sometimes they couldn't open an account, in which case they usually have to call, make an appointment, go into the office, and see what information is impeding their ability to set up that online account. So then the question becomes on the general philosophy behind Social Security and how it plays into our retirement security. And how does Social Security support us in retirement? So most financial planners would currently define Social Security benefits in retirement as one leg of a four-legged retirement chair. The other three legs of the chair would traditionally be other income, such as earned income or rental income, savings and investment income, and pension income. Um, now, there's not as many pensions as there used to be back in the day. Um, some people don't work into Social Security years, so they don't have earned income, they don't own rentals. And some people, unfortunately, haven't done as well that they have savings and investment income. So for a lot of people, Social Security is the only leg of the chair that's active for them. And the cost of living adjustments um, typically aren't keeping up with most people's view of what cost of living increases are like. Last year, it was 1.3%. This year, 5.9%. Inflation's running right now. They estimate around 7.5%. So it's probably going to be higher next year. Unfortunately, we get calls all the time now from clients who all over the county are experiencing uh, rent increases of easily 10% year over year. And so a 5.9% raise isn't keeping up with a 10% rent increase, unfortunately. So I'm going to stop and make sure we didn't have any questions come in yet. We good? Okay, sounds like we're good. So for 2021, what does the system look like? Well, the system looks like this. As of March of last year, there were about 69.7 million recipients of Social Security in the U.S., uh, nine out of 10 of those citizens age 65 and over benefit from Social Security. So most seniors 65 and over are getting a Social Security income stream of some kind. Uh, it's known that Social Security keeps at least 15 million elderly Americans out of poverty. The maximum benefit available in 2021 was $3,895 per month. The trust fund, as of when I did this last year, was at $2.9 trillion in reserves. But the concern was that U.S. workers retiring after 2035 will receive only about 75% of full benefits based on current budget projections. Now, again, that number moves back and forth, as does the amount that's in reserves. Um, in terms of recessionary times, the number gets sooner. Boom times, the number gets pushed back a bit. Plus, there can be legislation to kind of adjust how that number is configured in terms of how much is going into the trust fund to pay benefits. Now, ever since I was a kid, I remember my parents talking about Social Security and the concerns that there were about it running out of money. Um, I believe around in the 80s, they adjusted their retirement age from being 65 for most people to 67 for people coming up after that period of time. So I think mine is gonna be fully at 67. I think my wife's is like 66 and six months because she's a few years older than me. So that's one way they did an adjustment 
to make the uh, social security system a little more solvent. So how do we qualify for social security retirement benefits? Well, basically it's linked to your earned income. So you earn credits when you work and have earned income and pay social security taxes. That's a deduction that shows on your paycheck stub. You must have at least 40 credits, which is 10 years of earned income, and you must be 62 or older to claim benefits as a retired person. You each, uh, each $1,320 in earnings gives you one credit, and, but you can only earn a maximum of four credits per year. So for most people, you have to have worked 10 years um, to have earned income over a 10 year period of time. And this is why it becomes a concern from, for a lot of clients that we have that were small business owners or people that kind of always work jobs that were not paying through a payroll system that were just paying cash, for example, that doesn't get recognized in the social security system. So it's not unusual in, in my experience that we've run across small business owners that had pretty prominently known businesses here in Pierce County that I've worked with in retirement who never really paid themselves a salary. Everything went back into their business and they might've taken a minimal, minimal amount of cash for a living expenses that they never counted for social security. And as a result, um, even though they're known business people, they get very little social security income in retirement. And how does social security determine our benefits? They're based on earned income, like I said. So your earned income is adjusted for changes in wage levels over time. So most of us remember back when we first started working, our minimum white wage might've been three or $4 an hour back in the day. Again, they, there's an adjustment that happens over your lifetime to put some level of parity at wage levels when you retire. So they kind of account for inflation in the system. It's very complex. I don't know the full ins and outs of that but it's built into the system that if you are a lower wage earner over a lifetime, you don't lose in terms of not getting anything back at the end. You get some level of social security that's adjusted for inflation. But they do look at the monthly average of your 35 highest earning years. So if most of us started working, say out of college at age 22, and we work uh, the next 35 years, that gets us to age 57. Now, most of us wouldn't say, well, I'm going to stop working then because we need to keep working until we get to Social Security. Plus, the assumption is as we get into a 50, our 50s, uh, even our early 60s, that we're hopefully earning more money than we did in our 20s. And so it is the 35 highest earning years that they pull out. So those higher income years later in life knock out those lower income years earlier in life. And that's where you end up with your 35 highest earning years. And the result of this calculation is your average indexed monthly earnings. Lower income earners receive a higher benefit compared to their payroll taxes. So again, when there's some discussion about changes to social security, unfortunately, a lot of our elected officials don't understand how the legislation has been implemented over the years. And a lot of them don't understand kind of this piece, this piece, this piece, Sometimes they'll say things like, well, let's just make kind of an adjustment to Social Security so everybody gets more. Well, that's going to impact the solvency of the system, but it's also going to impact calculations going forward as well. So, so keep that in mind. It's a very complex system, and I'm all for people getting more money on Social Security, but there are certain safeguards built into the system so it doesn't become too lopsided on one side or another. So what is the full social security retirement age for most people today? So this is where the adjustment was made because prior to being born in 1943, your full retirement age for most people was 65, but from 43 to 54, you jump up to 66 and then incrementally you're adding on months each uh, from each co cohort of years going forward until when you get to my point when I was born in 65, 67 years is my full retirement age. My wife, who was born in 59, 66 years and 10 months old, is her full retirement age. And so by full retirement age, that's the uh, benefit where you're not getting any loss for retiring sooner than 65, but you can still get more if you wait. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And that's where this question comes in. What is the best quote unquote age to retire? 
So this question comes up a lot and it's changed over the years. Monthly benefits differ based on the age that you start, decide to start receiving the social security benefits. And social security does not care if you claim early or late. 25% of most people claim at age 62. I think that number was probably even higher over the last couple of years because a lot of people that were falling out of the workforce or didn't feel comfortable having to continue work with the virus spreading decided to retire early. So that's when you see a lot of talk about workforce participation. I think a lot of it had to do with people coming up into age 62 who realized I could retire, feel more comfortable and safe not working um, and draw my social security early. So what does early retirement mean in terms of the cash benefit? Well, assuming the benefit would be 1,000 per month at a full retirement age of 66 here, if you retire earlier than that, you lose something on the monthly benefit. So you lose 25% or so at age 62. So you're gonna draw 750 a month, age 63, 800 a month, age 64, 866, age 65, 933. And then the example again gives us age 66, 1000 per month. But as you can see, if you delay any of these years and go longer before claiming, well, then you're going to add each month 1,080, 1,160, 1,240, 1,320. And that doesn't mean you have to keep working to that age. All it means is that you could stop working and then claim later. So some would say, well, it's best to claim early because none of us know how long we might live. And so one question some financial planners ask is, you know, what's the longevity in your family? Your parents live long lives, do siblings live long lives? or is longevity much shorter in your family? Now that's more of an art than a science, but there's some actuari actuarial truth behind that in terms of how they determine those things. On the other hand, if someone's very comfortable with their investments and other income, then they might wanna delay their social security draw to age 70 and get much more per month, um, or they may decide they wanna keep working. I had a gentleman in our office who retired, I think at 74, he kept working in his, into his full retirement period, and so he was happy to do the work he was doing. He enjoyed it. And so he kept uh, a delay on his social security until he could draw a much higher amount. And what is life expectancy telling us? Now, some of this may have changed with the virus because that's skewing some of this data. But as of 2021, which I'm guessing the statistics were a year or two behind, a man reaching age 65 in that year can expect to live on average until 84 years and three months. A woman reaching age 65 last year can expect to live until age 86 and six months. However, and I don't think it's unusual for most of us in our day-to-day -li day lives, in day -to -day lives among friends and family members, about one in four, age 60, four people age 65 years and older last year will live past age 90. One out of 10 will live past age 95. Now, my uh, mother lived to just a month shy of 93. My dad lived just a two months shy of 96. A good friend of mine, just recently, his grandmother passed. She was still living at home at age 103. So it's not unusual that we know people in these late longevity periods of their lives uh, who are still going strong, thank goodness. So there's different financial retirement planning strategies for Social Security, but make sure you research to determine what's the best strategy for you. The rules can and will change, so make sure you have the latest information and know the right questions to ask. For a long time, because of this life expectancy information, the advice was always delay Social Security as long as you possibly can. And then in recent years, especially with the virus spread, the thought was no claim earlier rather than later because there's this virus spreading around. There's my wife, for example. Thank God she's still very healthy, but she's a type 1 insulin-dependent diabetic. She's 63 this year, and she's been a type 1 diabetic diagnosed when she was 10 years old. So her life expectancy at that time was maybe 25 years old. So thank God she's going strong. And so we're kind of questioning, well, should she draw now? She's still working part-time. Should she draw later? Um, there's a school of thought that says, always draw sooner rather than later because we don't know our health outcomes. There's another school of thought that says it's more likely you're gonna live longer than live shorter, so, so claim later. There's one thing that's changed dramatically in the last few years. That's the example here. There used to be 
an ability to claim early and then pay it back, that strategy is no longer allowed after the first 12 months that you claim. So what a lot of financial advisors used to tell people is claim at age 62, earn that money from Social Security for a few years, and then just pay it all back to Social Security four years later, reset your Social Security draw age and draw the higher benefit. Now, this was one that was used for people that were very prosperous and doing well with their investments to do this. Social Security caught on to it and said, no, you can't do that anymore. So you can only do that in the first 12 months that you claim and then that eligibility for that, that system kind of play has went away after that. I'm gonna stop again, are we doing okay? Any questions come through? Matt. Yes. Uh, um, I had heard that retiring at 70 and claiming social security or claiming social security at 70 that was the highest amount of social security you could, would ever get. If you delay it to 71, 72, does it still keep going up? So great question, you're right. It stops at 70 in terms of uh, the highest amount you can get. However, that example I gave of the gentleman who worked to 74, if he had chosen uh, not to claim until 74, then those additional higher earnings years potentially could have increased the amount he would have gotten if he had claimed at 70. Now, Thank you. yeah, and, and that kind of brings us nicely into this slide because what about earned income from work while you're receiving social security benefits? So if you're under the full retirement age, you're limited on what you can earn if you start drawing before full retirement age. You're limited to this annual amount Otherwise, you lose $1 for every $2 of earnings above that amount. Um, so if you're at 62, you're still working, you have to be mindful of not breaching this earned income level while you're drawing your early Social Security. Otherwise, you'll be penalized. In the year you reach full retirement age, you can make much more on earned income, this higher amount. If you go over it, you lose $1 for every $3 of earnings. The good news is once you reach your full retirement age, like the example I gave for my friend at work, he could have started to claim at that age and continued working with no penalty to his social security benefit. So I didn't go into a discussion with him about that, but he could have claimed at 65, I think that was his full retirement age or 66, whatever it was, and kept his full salary while drawing his social security. Now his social security wouldn't have kept growing at that point in terms of the monthly benefit, but he could have done that. And if he decided to wait until 74, then he was going to get even a higher benefit because that benefit up to age 70 would have been recalculated for his additional higher income earning years. And taxation, this question comes a lot up a lot, may be taxable depending upon your situation. So please consult an IRS tax filing expert. Most of the clients we work with, their social security is maybe $1,000, $1,200 a month, maybe $900 a month, and that's their only income. So they're not gonna have to file uh, a tax return each year because of that, because they're gonna be exempt. And I think the level goes as high as income, as high as like 23,000 or something like that. But some people have earned income, some people have rental income, investment income, so they may have to file. And then it's just a question of whether Social Security benefits are adding to that tax burden. They might have. I'm not a tax expert, so you would want to talk to a tax expert about that. And before we go on, we're always reminding people about COVID-19 still circulating and vaccine availability. So there's testing still available, vaccines still plentiful and available. You can talk to the health department at this number about scheduling, transportation, booster shots, and there's still the home vaccination capability for first vaccines and boosters. Just call this number. I know out in the peninsula, I think uh, in the Key Pen uh, Center there, we've been having uh, a vaccine clinic there every Friday, I think it is, for vaccines and boosters. I think there's probably some pharmacies and doctor's offices in the area out there that are providing vaccines as well. So it's still up in the air whether routinely there's gonna be boosters for everyone past the first round of boosters. 
I'm guessing that will be recommended here soon, especially for the senior population. But for now, that availability is still there for first time vaccines, boosters. And then if you know people, or if you are a person who's stuck at home, can't get to a vaccine clinic, you can call the health department and they can provide a vaccination or booster in your home. So we'll touch a little bit on these other aspects of social security. Supplemental security income was one, also known as SSI. This is different than what we've talked about with social security retirement. This is a very limited cash benefit which is linked to people who are low income and low resources and eligible for Medicaid coverage. So this is typically for people considered aged, blind, and disabled who typically didn't have those 10 years of earned income in to qualify for Social Security, or they had it and the income amount was so low that they don't get their full Social Security allotment and they head into uh, retirement. So if they're 65 or they're younger, blind, disabled, they can get this SSI benefit as long as their resources for one person are under 2,000, under 3,000 for a married couple. So sometimes it can be combined. Sometimes we see people on social security retirement of $600 a month. They have no resources to speak of. So they're getting an additional 241 a month to bring them up to this standard for SSI. Other cases we see people who were never able to fully work in their whole lifetimes, they're considered disabled and so they get an SSI grant or they go into social security retirement as an aged person just getting this very limited SSI grant. And then there's social security disability where if you do have enough earned income, you can qualify. There's not a resource limit and you could potentially qualify even under a spouse's benefit. So you must have worked long enough and recently enough, you must have had a medical condition preventing you from performing substantial work that has lasted or expected to last at least 12 months or will result in your death within a 12 month period. They also consider age, education and past work in determining your ability to return to substantial work. But this amount is usually the same amount as what it would be if you reached your full retirement age. So say at age 52, you had an industrial accident, lost a limb or lost the use of your limbs, lost hearing, lost vision, whatever the case might be, might have had a brain injury. If Social Security qualifies you for disability coverage, then you're going to get um, Social Security disability, which will typically be the same amount as if you had continued to work to full retirement age. Now, again, this is a process very different than retirement age when it's just your age that's going to qualify you you have to verify and prove to them that you do have a disabling condition where you typically have to report to Social Security your lack of work, the reasons you're not working, and the medical condition that's preventing you from being able to work. So there's medical verification that has to go with it. Sometimes you have to do an interview with a Social Security um, claims adjudicator. It's not an easy process. And some times people are denied one, two, or three times in which case we usually have them consult a social security disability attorney to properly file to get their disability claim. Any questions on those aspects of non-retirement social security? And are you checking the Facebook live comments? Good, okay. So spousal benefits, again, it's based on um, the earned income over a lifetime of your spouse and how long you were married to them. Um, minimum age is 62 that you can claim on a spouse's benefit. Up to 50% of the working spouse's full benefit, but less if claimed early. Um, if you're born after January 1, 54, you must file for your own benefit first, and then Social Security will determine what's the higher benefit if you're filing early. A divorced spouse, you must have had 10 years of marriage and now be single, and former spouse is not required to apply for own benefit, at least at age 62. And reminder, if you're claiming benefits before full retirement age, the earned income limit of 19,560 applies. This can often get very, very much into the weeds in terms of what's the base, best claiming strategy as a spouse. So in this case, I would want you to talk to a financial planner that's familiar with social security claiming strategies because there's all kinds of strategies to claim on one benefit, to spend it, wait, and then claim on the spouse's benefit. 
it can very much get into the weeds. I don't want to confuse people, but it's not unusual that we see people that are claiming on a spouse's benefit um, before um, they would ever claim on their own. Even though they're getting 50%, it's still higher than if that person as the spouse hadn't worked much during their lifetime. And the spousal benefits, again, um, um, when you would get your claim, then you would be claiming on the social security number of your spouse. And people often ask, you know, is there a spousal limit? So what if someone had been married three times for 10 years each time? Does that limit the ability of any spouse, whether uh, divorced or surviving spouse to claim? No, it does not. There's not a limit on the claiming that could happen on a spouse's account, even if that person had two or three husbands or two or three wives over their lifetime. Because that question comes up a lot. Oh, I'm gonna claim and that's gonna knock out some ex-wife or ex-husband. Doesn't work that way. Everybody can claim and their benefit would be based upon the period they were married to that spouse. Okay, Social Security survivor benefits. At age 60, the survivor receives 71.5% of the deceased full retirement age benefit amount, but waiting to claim increases the payment amount. If disabled, the survivor can claim as early as age 50. A surviving divorce spouse must have been married for 10 years to that person who has passed away. And you must be single unless remarriage after age 60 and age 50 and disabled. So. This all relates to having been married to someone who passes and whether you can claim on their benefit um, as a surviving spouse. That's what social security survivor benefits are all about. So the rules are different than just for a spouse who's claiming on a living spouse's account. This is if the, the spouse that you're claiming on has passed away. The earnings income limit still applies, however. So again, this is something that people would really want to discuss with a financial planner because you can claim survivor benefits earlier than you can claim early retirement. Um, one does not really affect the other, but one may be more beneficial than the other. So that's again, a discussion you would want with a financial planner. And then there's also social security survivor benefits for children. This is a case where a child can receive survivor benefits from a deceased parent if the child is not married and is under the age of 18 or 19 and still in high school, a disabled child can receive survivor benefits from a deceased parent beyond the age of 18 if the child is not married and was disabled before the age of 23. So again, this is huge. My um, uncle, um, my mom's brother, died during his working years, leaving his wife and I think four kids under the age of 18. And so the system of Social Security really helped um, my aunt um, survive during those times and support the children because it was understood that, that he was the main earner in the family and the children and his wife would have been impoverished if not for this Social Security benefit that came to them. So when people talk about, well, Social Security is just for a very small segment of the community and blah, 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 that's really not true. <laughs> it affects families, it affects young people, it affects uh, husbands and wives that are widowed, it affects a young person that might have been disabled, or a person that's like this in a situation where they were disabled from a young age and not going to be able to enter the workforce, and it provides a cash benefit to support them throughout their lives, even though they were never able to work. So how do we fund this system? Comes up a lot, people talk about different ways of funding it. Right now, it's a payroll tax from your paycheck of 12.4%. The employer pays half and the employee pays the other half. So you see these deductions on your paycheck. Stuff. Payroll tax is limited to $142,800 of earned income per year for single taxpayers. That's the maximum amount that we can, can be counted to determine your benefit. So when there's a lot of discussion in politics about lifting the social security payroll tax limit, that refers to this limit in terms of why aren't we taxing people with higher earned incomes than this to fund the system. And the discussion usually involves raising this limit much higher or limited, eliminating the limit amount altogether. Now the question then would be, this is the limit by which a person gets a social security benefit calculated. If they jump this up to say 242,800, 
Does that mean that we're going to get a benefit that's linked to that higher income amount? Or are we going to still keep this as the cap for the benefit outlay? There's always been concerns about that because earned income is considered to be the barometer by which you get the benefit. And people worry that if we lift this cap and we don't lift the benefit, then there's going to be a lot of outcry. But if we lift the benefit and lift the cap, there's a question of really whether it does any good upon the system. So those are some inside baseball kind of things to think about when you're hearing these political proposals about changing. Now, Medicare is different. There is no Medicare payroll tax on earned income. The Medicare payroll tax is 2.9%, again, split 50-50. And there is an additional surcharge on earned income starting at 200,000 per year for single taxpayers. So Medicare has already kind of made this leap. They don't have this cap. So if you're getting 200,000 a year income, $500,000 a year earned income, you're paying a scalable Medicare payroll tax up to that level and you're getting a surcharge attached to it. So keep that in mind. So, so Medicare is a different system than Social Security in that regard. So finally, we get to is disabled adult child benefits, which typically confuses everyone. These are collected on a parent's work record for a parent that must be deceased or alive, but already collecting Social, social Security retirement or disability benefits. The disabled adult child must be 18 years or older and unmarried, but that disabled adult child's approved disability must have started before the age of 22. And a family limit does apply and can limit the parent's benefit. So occasionally at the Aging and Disabilities Office, we'll get called, calls from parents who are asking about this program and they are now retired or one spouse might've gone on disability or one of the spouses might've passed away but they have a 25-year-old or 30-year-old adult child who's been disabled for a long period of time into their youth, and they're seeking a way to improve their income by claiming on that parent's account. And so it's not unusual we get these inquiries. Um, it's nice if this can happen because most of these adult children are getting just the SSI grant and Medicaid. If they claim on a parent's account, they can typically get Medicare as well for health coverage, and a higher cash benefit, but they also get to keep their Medicaid as well. So this is really a nice program if you can make it happen. However, there is a family limit that can apply and can limit the parent's benefit. So we had a situation where a husband and wife got a notice that the wife's claiming amount on the husband was being reduced because an adult child was awarded this a disabled adult child benefit in her 30. And so he had not had contact with his adult child for years and so was surprised that this information came through. Well, her claiming basically reached the cap of the family limit in this situation. So his wife's social security income was reduced because of this disabled adult child's claiming. So this doesn't come up a whole lot. It's a system that most professionals really struggle with understanding because it kind of goes against some of the other rules we talked about, but periodically you might have someone inquire about a disabled adult child benefit if you're a professional, or you might have a disabled adult child in your family where you're looking into this. So there's definitely advantages to it, but there can be some drawbacks to it as well. So that's the presentation. If you'd like me to give this presentation to other small or large groups that you have, I'm happy to do it free of charge. Uh, with enough notice, I could do it during the work week or even evenings all around the weekends. We can do it live in person now if it's loud in your venue or do it via Zoom. That's our phone number if you wanna call there. We also have vaccine updates. We also have some information, of course, about all kinds of aging and disability resources caregiver support programs, home repair programs, transportation services, medical equipment, hearing vision programs, energy assistance, all kinds of stuff. There's the number for Medicare. Also added the number for SHIBA, which is the State Health Insurance Benefits Advisors who work a lot with Medicare programs, as, as does Sound Outreach, and also the number for Social Security. So that is the presentation. If anyone has questions, I'm gonna stop sharing now. and I'll make you the host again. Oh, you're still the host, it looks like, so that's okay.
Okay, well, thank you, Matt. That was uh, very clear and gave a lot of information that has, um, at least to me, up till now been obscure. <laughs> I'm wondering if you could touch on, you mentioned at the beginning that if you as a caseworker or a family member need to talk to the Social Security Administration, then the person whose account you're calling about must be present. Yes. What happens if the person is unable to communicate for reasons of dementia or some other disability? How does that work? So this is where it becomes really challenging because I went through this with my own parents. Um, and so uh, typically, um, this was prior to the virus, I actually had to bring my mother in uh, with my dad to the social security office and then have her actually meet with the worker face to face and we produced documents and things. And then they were in terms of verifying her identity and who I was. And then she was able to at least say yes, that they could also talk freely with me being present. Um, if you're trying to do that over the phone, I failed with my mother because she couldn't really process the, the conversation even, even on a speaker phone. And so lacking the ability to bring her in, I would have had to file as being her payee and handling her funds in order to communicate freely with Social Security. They do not recognize a power of attorney form. They will recognize a state appointed guardianship as you being the guardian. But again, that's a, that's a process that goes through a judicial review and can be a bit expensive and lengthy. So the best aspect of going forward on that is to apply to be the payee um, as early in the process as possible. And all that means is that you'll have an account set up for that person that you're the payee of where you have to do a report, I think yearly that says how the money's being expended. Um, but it, it's one of those really tricky problems that we do run into a lot with people with diminished capacity, traumatic brain injury, things like that, where there hasn't been the adequate preparation to get that payee service set up. So it really is wise to have that set up one way I handled that in terms of the money is that early on, I was able to get myself named as a co-signer on the bank account into which the social security was deposited. So that at least allowed me to write checks on the account for my mom to withdraw money to transfer funds. That was one way I worked around it, but that, that wasn't involving co communication with social security. It was just handling the bank account into which the funds were deposited. So. So then if you have a joint account, say with a spouse, that would help in establishing yourself as a payee? Uh, yes, it, it would, because then um, you're already on the account. And so when you notify Social Security, I believe there's the, a process on the socialsecurity.gov website where you can either print out a payee application or you can submit one electronically. That's the other way to really manage the social security affairs for someone is to um, get the social, social security.gov account set up for them, because then you can do many of the actions you need to do through that portal on social security. You can get benefit letter, letters, you can do uh, changes of address for direct uh, mail, you can change bank accounts, deposit information on the mysocialsecurity.gov. That's what I did on behalf of my dad. Um, to help him out, so. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And I'll say uh, you're free to distribute that PowerPoint to anyone that you find it to be useful for groups or individuals who request it. It's, it's certainly not proprietary for us. So if people would find that to be useful to have that, it's, it's a little dated already. It's always gonna be dated when it's produced because things change, but it does give a good overview of the principles behind it. I have a question. Yes. Okay. So my uh, person, and we're not married, is took early retirement at 62. He uh, suffered a brain injury back in uh, when he was 20. And now that we've moved and everything has changed, he can't, he can't remember his address. Like, and he had a job where they gave him work. You know, he, um, 
They gave him work. So he worked there. That was the only job he had after his brain injury. And I'm realizing now he couldn't, he can't fill out an application. He can't even remember our address. Um, it'd be hard for him to look for work. Can I apply with the um, traumatic brain injury information that I have for him to get disability instead of early benefits? Yeah, so that's one thing I didn't touch on, but it's an excellent question. Yes, it's not unusual that the guidance is for someone that's not able to work any longer to apply for that early benefit so they'll have some survivor income coming in when they're not working while they're pursuing the disability application, which potentially will give them a higher benefit on the disability draw than the early retirement is giving. Okay, so, yeah. so he hasn't worked for about a year and has been collecting, but it's still, I can go ahead, I can go into, I set up an account for him on social Great. security that Excellent. I manage. So I can go in there and do whatever it tells me and send it off and see what happens. Yeah, you should be good in doing that because like I said, um, they won't uh, penalize him for doing that early draw if he becomes a disability social security income uh, recipient. Uh, they'll just jump him to that higher amount, which should be what his normal full retirement age account would have been. Um, so that would, that would benefit him greatly to do that. It would, and it would help him to not be fretting and worrying about how he could get a job or get to a job or, you know, we talked about even being a greeter at Walmart, he can't remember anything. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. So, okay. And he hasn't like been seeing a doctor about it because it just is what it is. So the documentation, I called the Craig hospital in Denver or emailed them and they sent me all his records because okay. he was in a coma and everything. Do you think that would suffice possibly? It should, you know, it's always questionable. I've, I've dealt with clients that I thought, you know, we're hundred percent going to be approved. They're denied. I've got people that seemed a bit marginal in the documentation and they're approved. I always tell people to assume that the first time around that there might be a denial, but that doesn't mean that ultimately they're not gonna be found disabled. So it, it would be wise for him to at least have a primary care just based upon his age to, to be seeing someone each year where he's reporting out that he has this history, this memory loss due to the brain injury. And they're at least verifying that nothing's changed on that in his current medical record, because that's typically part of the disability application. They not only want to know that it's happened, but that it's not changed for the better for that person going forward. And usually they'll ask, you know, who's the current medical professional the person seeing, even if there's not active treatment going on, like you're saying, but at least then he's got someone who's verifying, yes, I'm seeing this person. And yes, he's reported that these are his disabling symptoms and nothing changed on it. So, so set up a medical hole. <laughs> medical hole. Yeah. That's the word the term they can use, medical hole. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think if anyone met him, they would know if you had any extended conversation with him. I mean, it's not blatantly obvious, but yeah. Okay. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Excellent questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have any other questions, but this presentation is going to be permanently on our YouTube channel right. it will also remain on our Facebook site so if we do get any questions via either of those channels uh, we can pass them on to you and hopefully people will pay attention to the slide that you put up at the end giving yeah. all the contact information yeah I hope so and, uh, just once again I would like to say how much I appreciate such a clear informative uh, session from you, Matt. It's th that was really great. Thanks for inviting me. I'm always happy to reach out. Uh, and in the future, if we want to do it again, happy to do it again. Okay, sure. thank you. And thank just, you. Be thank you. just before we leave, I'd like to mention that uh, if you haven't seen the progress on our assisted living construction across the street from our Crandall Center, please either do a drive-by or check into our Facebook site for um, and our website for our drone shots and other photographs showing how well we're doing and we're still on target to finish construction at the end of November. This is a really exciting time to be part of the mustard seed.
And with that, we will end today's community forum. Thank you to everybody who participated. Bye.